Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is part 15 of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg created by Jimbo Seth. Make sure to check out the previous parts if you have not already. I'll link the playlist with all of them in the description for you guys. And just before we start, I wanted to let you guys know that I am in the process of creating a sort of community mystery iceberg with entries from myself as well as you guys. Now, that will be an ongoing project where I will be ranking the entries in real time with you guys within the iceberg in each video. So there's a link in the description to a Google form that you can submit if there are any mysteries you guys would like me to cover. I'm not sure if the Google form allows you to submit multiple times from one email. So on the chance that it does restrict you, it is okay to submit several entries into a single Google form if you would like. And finally, some of the entries in this iceberg video are a bit graphic, so viewer's discretion is advised. In the mid-1870s, there was a series of tremors in North Carolina that struck fear into locals. The earliest tremor can be traced back to February of 1874, where people living near Chimney Rock claimed to have felt some intense quakes in the ground and heard thunderous booms coming from Bald Mountain. According to some, there were even traces of smoke coming from the ground. These claims are what drove residents to become fearful that a volcano could erupt soon. However, when tourists and news crews came to examine the site, they didn't exactly experienced the same things. As news outlets caught wind of the rumors, they hopped on the wave and began printing out various articles revolving around the strange events in the mountains. This only resulted in more fear and panic within the community. One preacher even held a religious revival saying, the strong hearts of these wicked people will move by causing the mountain to shake and tremble beneath their feet. This spurred on numerous additional religious gatherings and a resident was quoted saying, cattle, horses, and hogs were turned to the woods and the entire people within the range of this awful excitement have concluded that they have but a few more days to live. The New York Times is one of the more notable news sources covering the Bald Mountain events and eventually claimed that it was a third-rate hoax. A professor named Warren Dupree from Wofford College learned about the tremors and it sparked his curiosity enough for him to make a trip to North Carolina. Warren brought along about a dozen students, a civil engineer, and a church worker. The group made its way along Bald Mountain and they reported that they had felt the shaking claimed by the locals. However, the group didn't see any smoke, sinking caverns, melting snow, or any of the weirder occurrences that were said to be taking place. Once the research was completed, Warren headed back to submit an official report for the Smithsonian Institution. But even Warren was left a bit dazed by the situation. In his report, Warren wrote, The phenomena must be referred to that general volcanic or earthquake force which seems as necessary to the economy of nature as light, heat, or electricity. And I'm not gonna lie, I don't understand what that means at all. The way it's written is just so jarring, to me at least, and I just can't comprehend it at all. So if you were able to understand what that meant, feel free to let me know in the comments. But anyways, the tremors continued for several months before abruptly stopping in early May. Some investigators suggest that the tremors may have been caused by large rock falls in a network of caves under the mountain. Today's video is brought to you by Private Internet Access VPN. PIA is a VPN service that masks your real IP address to make it appear as though you are from a different state or even different country. Browsing the internet without an encrypted connection is as good as sending a message that you intended to be private to everybody that you know. Whenever you connect to the Wi-Fi on a public network such as an airport or a coffee shop, you could be at risk from the prying eyes of hackers and internet service providers. Use PIA to protect any of your devices, including your your phone, computer, and much more. And even better, you can use PIA on as many devices as you want with just a single account. You can protect your entire household with a single subscription, costing around $2 a month. In case you aren't aware, there are thousands of sites and services across the internet that severely limit the amount of content that you can access based on your location. But with PIA, you can do things such as stream a completely different library of shows and movies on services like Netflix, Hulu, and more. For example, if you're in the US, you can't watch shows like The Office, Rick and Morty, or Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but if you switch your location to the UK, you now have access to those shows. You can even get exclusive deals for online purchases, including clothing, flights, and games. By simply turning on private internet access, you can leap past those restrictions and select a new IP from any of the 80 plus countries that PIA offers. With a 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 customer support, there's no reason not to try private internet access. So click the link below to take advantage of the 83% off and get yourself a subscription for just $2.03 and four months free.
Michaela Bali is the name of a 16-year-old girl who disappeared in her hometown of Yorkton, Saskatchewan. It was April 12th, 2016 when Michaela visited a restaurant in Yorkton where a surveillance camera caught a shot of her. This camera footage was the last time Michaela was ever seen and investigators have no idea where the girl went off to. Michaela was described as an intelligent and quick-witted girl, being an amazing student and loving daughter. She shared with her family at one point that she had dreams of moving out of Canada and going to the US one day. Her mother said that she could be shy at times and that she met most of her friends online on various websites and apps like Snapchat, Instagram, and other chat-based providers. On the day of her disappearance, Michaela texted one of her friends named Oksana, asking for a ride to the bank. It was around 6.40 a.m. at this point. Oksana didn't think much of this, and Michaela added that she needed to withdraw around $5,000. However, authorities later determined that this was a complete lie. While Michaela's friend didn't think the request was abnormal, she did refuse, saying that she was busy. It was almost 8.30 a.m. when Michaela showed up to school, which was Sacred Heart High School. When she entered the facility, she immediately headed towards her locker, but later left the school through the back. From here, Michaela headed towards the bank and was caught on CCTV, speaking to someone on the phone. Michaela waited outside the bank for the teller to open up, and when they did, she hung up the phone immediately and withdrew a total of $55 from her account, a long shot from the $5,000 that she told her friend about. Witnesses reported seeing Michaela entering a pawn shop where the owner said that she tried to sell a ring, but the owner refused to buy it for whatever reason. Those that encountered Michaela all noted that she moved with urgency and angst. Some people even mentioned that Michaela was begging others who entered a nearby hotel to buy her a room or to drive her to another town that wasn't too far away. It seemed clear to investigators that Michaela's end goal involved her leaving her hometown and fast. Michaela stopped inside a Tim Hortons around 9am, then stepped out at 9.20 before walking back in again at around 9.50. And when she re-entered the restaurant, she was speaking into her phone again. And the strange thing was that after she was done talking, she took apart the device and then put it back together. Michaela decided to text another friend of hers named Shelby about a quarter past 10, saying that she needed her help. But not long after, she said, never mind, I figured it out. It was just about 12 p.m. when Michaela finally made it back to her school, but she then left for a bus station and that's where her trail just went cold. Michaela's family went to her school to pick her up, but as the time passed and they realized that Michaela wasn't there, they contacted authorities and Michaela was declared missing. There are many theories as to what happened to Michaela, but as you can probably guess, they're pretty much all inconclusive at best since most don't really have any evidence backing them up. Police were able to discover a hidden Instagram account that Michaela kept secret, but the account did not have any photos or posts on it. What it did have was the word goodbye and the about me portion of the account. There was also a questionable post on her Snapchat made in February of 2016 that said, Looking for Snapchat friends because I have none in real life. Add me. Please don't be a greasy f and send me gross ass nudes. Just looking for a friend. When interviewing some of Michaela's friends, police found out that Michaela was telling people about how she planned to go to Regina, a trip which would have been about 150 miles from where Michaela went missing. One suspect that popped up was a man named Christopher who lived in Saskatchewan. Apparently, Michaela had made plans to visit him, but when police went to Chris's home, they didn't find anything suspicious. Now, Chris informed police that Michaela may have been He wasn't sure how serious she was about it, but she claimed to have attempted to take her own life once before. Another suspect was Michaela's biological father, but he was quickly ruled out. He didn't play much of a factor in Michaela's life as he went through a divorce with Michaela's mother, but since her disappearance, he has been making an effort in finding her. Then there was one more suspect who held open the door for Michaela at the restaurant, but this guy was quickly removed. Another thing about Michaela is that she supposedly carried around various substances when she went missing. Her friend said that she brought oxycodone to school to show people. Most people believe that Michaela was starting to feel lonely and she had simply had enough of her life in her small town and may have been kidnapped after being baited with false promises. Or perhaps she really did successfully find a way to live a brand new life somewhere else in the world. But obviously most people think this is a stretch as she was just 16 years old and she only had about $50 in her pocket. So I'd love to hear what you guys think happened to Michaela. And one final detail that I failed to include earlier is that those phone calls she made were actually done through an app and not directly with her own number, making it more difficult to trace just who she was calling.
Our next entry takes us over to the state of Texas. In 1946, the city of Texarkana had to suffer from the wrath of the Phantom Killer who wore a white mask and stalked a residence in the night. In total, there were eight victims, five of whom died. It took no more than three months for this killer to commit four atrocious acts of violence. The town was petrified and few people living in Texarkana at the time were willing to go out at night thinking that they might just be the next fall victim to this mystery killer. The first attack took place on the night of February 22nd, 1946, and the two victims were 25-year-old Jimmy Hollis and his girlfriend Mary Jean Larry. The young couple pulled over to a secluded lover's lane that wasn't far from town. Based on the reports, the phantom killer walked up to the car window while holding out a gun. The killer commanded Hollis to remove his clothing, specifically his pants, before being brutally beaten. The gunman then set his attention upon Mary. He wanted to play a sick game with her where he commanded her to run away from him before taking off after her. Mary sprinted for her life but ended up at a ditch where the killer then told her to change directions. Eventually, he caught up to her and assaulted her with his gun. Not knowing if she survived, she closed her eyes, but surprisingly, the gunman just let her go. When authorities arrived, Jimmy was in critical condition and rushed to a hospital. He sustained multiple severe injuries to his head, including a fractured skull. Both Mary and Jimmy said that the man was wearing a pillowcase over his face with eye holes cut out in the front. The next incident didn't occur until a month later in March. 29-year-old veteran Richard Griffin and his girlfriend Polly Moore were also parked along a secluded road for a romantic rendezvous when the phantom killer walked up to their vehicle with the same pistol. This time, the killer wasted no time and shot both of them in the head. No more than three weeks later, the phantom killed again. This time, the victims were 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker and 17-year-old Paul Martin. Paul picked up Betty from band practice and they also drove to a secluded area. At the crime scene, it did appear there was an attempt to escape from Betty as she was found nearly two miles from the car. This may have been the killer playing around with his victims yet again. Betty was shot in her face and chest and Paul was shot in the back of his head. Furthermore, Betty was raped with the gun just like Mary. And for whatever reason, the killer buttoned up Booker's shirt up to her chin and put her hands inside of her pockets. The shell casings found at the scene were a match to the previous two events, and authorities were able to find prints but they weren't able to develop a suspect profile from them. The third incident took place on May 3rd at a farmhouse. 37-year-old Virgil Starks was lounging in the living room when suddenly a bullet burst through his window and hit him. His wife Katie heard the thud from upstairs and raced down to see what had happened. When she saw her husband dying on the floor, she rushed to the phone but was also hit by a bullet from the same window. Shortly after, a second shot rang out and hit Katie again. She now had two wounds in her face and she struggled to see as blood was blocking out her vision. One bullet had struck her nose while the second broke her jaw and got lodged in her tongue. Katie heard footsteps entering the home and knowing that Virgil had already bled out, she sprinted out of the house in search of help from her neighbor. Katie was taken to the hospital and miraculously survived, but Virgil was not so fortunate. They were the last two confirmed victims of the Phantom Killer. Authorities were not making any inroad at finding the culprit and thus shut the city down. They did arrest hundreds of people who were suspected to be tied to the Phantom Killer. Investigators couldn't find out a solid motive for the killings, but they believed they were done for his own sick pleasure. Specifically, they believe that the man was some sort of sexual deviant that enjoyed the idea of killing someone, then raping their partner. One of the more prominent suspects was a man named UL Swinney. Police discovered that before each of the murders, there was also a car theft, and then shortly after the murders, they would find an abandoned vehicle which was previously stolen. And what do you know, Swinney had a long history of being a car thief. Additionally, he had past offenses including burglary and forgery. Swinney's wife reported him to police, but after numerous interviews, police had their doubts that she was telling the truth. Peggy did provide accurate details in her statements revolving around the crime scenes, but she wasn't able to give out correct locations and time frames. This led authorities to believe that she may have just hated her husband and tried to pin the murders on him after hearing about the case on the news. 
Swinney was later arrested, but not for the murders, and he died in 1994. Another suspect that was frequently mentioned was named H.B. Tennyson. H.B. was a college student at the time and had committed suicide, but he left behind a note where he confessed to the Texarkana murders. However, there were many false confessions in this case, and police were never able to gather any evidence that would suggest H.B. really was responsible. Despite the extensive investigation and media coverage at the time, the culprit behind the Texarkana Moonlight murders remains a mystery. Various suspects were interviewed and considered, but no one was ever charged or convicted of the crimes. The case has inspired books, documentaries, and even a movie titled The Town That Dreaded Sundown. If you're like me and have never heard of Cracker Barrel before, it's described as an old country store that doubles as both a restaurant as well as a sort of gift shop. And from what I can understand, this entire entry stemmed from a single Facebook post. A man named Brad made his way to the Cracker Barrel Facebook page and demanded to be told why his wife was fired. This comment became an ongoing meme from that point on. And during the peak of all this, everyone flooded Cracker Barrel's posts with comments asking why Brad's wife, who worked 11 years for Cracker Barrel, was fired. There was this one post that was made on their Facebook page at one point that said, Bradley Reed Bird's wife, Nanette, worked at the Indiana Cracker Barrel for 11 years, was fired by a district manager named Gwen Alexander. The reason given was, quote unquote, she wasn't working out. She was an older woman who co-workers and customers said was hardworking, averaging 50 to 60 hours a week. Since Cracker Barrel wouldn't give Brad and Annette a clear answer, he posted his question on their Facebook page and hashtag Brad's wife took off. However, some people think that Nanette was actually fired due to discrimination. The statement, she wasn't working out, could really mean anything. But then there was another rumor that said Nanette was given three warnings about her poor hygiene and when she didn't change her ways, the business fired her. Several people who recognized the name claimed that her cleanliness was poor and she gave off this foul odor. This entry refers to the mysterious disappearance of a woman and her child. The woman's surname was Liu and she was 37 years old at the time of her disappearance and her daughter was 4. On January 20th, 2008, Liu took her daughter to the Yuan Lin Financial Building in Taiwan via a scooter. Liu stepped inside of the elevator in the building at midnight and then just poof, disappeared in the building. When authorities were notified of the disappearance and arrived at the building, they were left baffled as to where she could have gone. One of the employees told police that Liu looked to be in a hurry and when they stopped her to ask why she was there, Liu said that she was there to see a friend. The employee thought nothing of this and let her pass. Liu jumped into the elevator with her daughter and that was the last time she was ever seen in person. There were several employees who clocked out of work and exited the building as the time passed, however, none of those people were Liu. Just where had she gone? The employee began to feel this ominous pit opening up in his stomach and went to sweep through the surveillance footage. And this is where that employee got really creeped out. He found images and video of Liu looking around nervously after getting into the elevator. When the elevator reached the 11th floor, Liu stepped out and took off her red coat, her shoes, and her daughter's pink coat and tossed everything back into the elevator. From there, she proceeded to leave the area. According to the staff, there was nobody on the 11th floor and they suspected that Liu made her way to the stairwell, which was not being monitored at the time. This same stairwell led up to the rest of the floors and ultimately to the roof. The employee swapped through the other cameras on the other floors but found no sign of Liu or her daughter. And that's basically it. We have no idea where she went after that. The entire 11th floor was searched but no traces of the two. That leaves only two possibilities. Either they went upwards and possibly even to the roof or they went down to a lower level. But there was still nothing when authorities searched the entire building. Police thought that it was most likely side, but the lack of a body suggests otherwise. And why did Liu take off her and her daughter's clothes and shoes? Investigators scoured the nearby area as well after running through the building and they were able to locate Liu's scooter. This didn't really help much in the case though as it pretty much just suggested that Liu never left the building. With nowhere else to search, investigators began to research Liu herself. It didn't take long for this event to make the headlines and it turned out that Liu had a husband. When her husband learned about the news, he immediately went to the police. 
According to him, he suspected that Liu may have ran away from home because of his drinking habits, which often led to him beating Liu. The relationship they had was bad. The couple had four kids, all of which were taken care of by their mother while the husband worked every day. But the thing is, the husband's work was very unstable and pay was not good. Shortly before Liu's disappearance, the couple had an especially harsh argument and Liu grabbed her four-year-old and left home on that scooter. As time went by and Liu failed to return home, the husband went to look for her in her hometown, but he never found her. Fast forward to the day where the husband heard the news, he said he never saw or had any contact with Liu leading up to that day after the 20th. Police interviewed all of the family members and they learned from the eldest daughter, who was still in junior high, that Liu told her she was going to a friend's house for a few days but would return soon. Investigators and internet sleuths are at a loss as to what happened to Liu and her 4 year old daughter. Some speculated that she was running away from someone, possibly even her own husband. And there's also the topic of the 11th floor. Why did she get off at that particular one when there were 16 in total? Peter Bergman is the name given to an unidentified man in Sligo, Ireland, who was discovered on June 16th, 2009. A local of the area named Arthur Kinsella was roaming a quiet beach with his son Brian before encountering a human body. The body was completely naked with the man's clothes strewn all along the shore. Arthur rushed to notify authorities and when they arrived to investigate the scene, they were shocked to find that the man had no form of identification in his clothing. Furthermore, all of his clothes had their tags cut off. According to some people who came across the man when he was traveling, he went by the name Peter Bergman and appeared to be in his late 50s or early 60s. With this lead, police started going through logs of people coming into the UK, but they couldn't find anyone with the name Peter Bergman. One of the logs they discovered was from a hotel which Peter stayed in prior to his death. In this particular list, they found an address that Peter gave, but it turned out to have been a fake. Fortunately, investigators didn't exhaust all of their resources just yet. There was a large network of CCTV cameras in Sligo that were able to record some of Peter's actions. It seemed that he left his hotel over a dozen times with a purple bag. When he left, the bag appeared to be full, but whenever he returned to the hotel, the bag was empty. And another pretty strange thing was that it seemed like Peter was intentionally avoiding the CCTV cameras when possible. He'd maneuver himself in such a way to get into the blind spot of a camera, and police suspect this is when he removed whatever items were in that purple bag. Investigators then went around these cameras looking for suspicious items that may have been disposed of by Peter, but there was absolutely nothing in sight. Later into the investigation, it was realized that the hotel Peter chose wasn't his first choice. The initial hotel he visited was full, so he had to resort to the one located in Sligo. He paid in advance for three days in the hotel, where he mainly kept to himself. He did take a trip to the post office, where he purchased several stamps as well as eight envelopes. When a taxi driver learned of the incident, he told police that he actually drove him to an isolated beach called Ross's Point. Peter had asked the taxi driver for a recommendation on a swimming location, and the driver suggested the earlier mentioned beach. He said he took Peter there, and Peter stayed in the area for about 15 minutes before going back to his hotel. After checking out of the hotel, Peter took a bus to Ross's Point, where a woman reported seeing him around 12 p.m. This was the last time Peter was seen alive, and the next morning his body was lying lifeless on the shore. Medical officials discovered that Peter had advanced prostate prostate cancer as well as several bone tumors, and judging from the state of his heart, it seemed like he had survived numerous heart attacks, but oddly enough, they couldn't find any trace of medication within his body. This leads to one of the many theories behind the case. Some people suggest that Peter had just had enough of his life after suffering through all of these health issues and wanted to find a quiet place to calm himself before he accepted his inevitable fate. Which seems pretty reasonable, however, it doesn't explain the purple bag and why he made such an effort to not be identified. And I couldn't really find justifiable reasoning for these theories, but some people even proposed that he may have been some sort of secret government agent or someone who had beef with the gangs. This case is very similar to the Summerton Man one, which we covered earlier in the iceberg. That case was solved back in 2022, and there were also theories saying that he was some sort of spy as well, but it turned out he was just a normal man. As of August of this year, DNA analysis was able to narrow down what region the man may have came from, but no progress in who he actually was.
The Sandown Clown is a mysterious being that became famous when two children reported their encounter with it at Lake Common in Sandown. The clown is said to be over 2 meters in height, which is about 6 foot 5. It had two legs, two arms, and an extremely large head relative to the rest of its body. The clown's skin was pale and had the texture of paper. Each of its hands and feet had three digits. Furthermore, the face on the sphere head looked as though it was painted on, and the design on the face is where the clown name comes from. The kids claimed that the clown was carrying a sort of microphone in its hands, which it used to speak. They also mentioned that before the clown appeared, there was some sort of wailing noise similar to an ambulance. It's suspected that this sound also came from the microphone. When the kids heard this sound, they went towards it, which took them across a footbridge above a stream. On the other side was the curious yet shy Sandown clown. It was said to be friendly and spoke to the kids for about half an hour. When the kids left and returned to their parents, the clown was never to be seen again. I am so sorry if I butchered this, but Lacanu de la Seine, or in English, the unknown woman of the Seine, was an unidentified woman whose death mask has become a popular art piece in homes around the 1900s, and I believe this is also the face used initially for CPR training dummies. But who is she? There is a story claiming that the young woman's body was found in River Seine in Paris in the late 1880s. Medical officials couldn't find any wounds or signs of a struggle on her body, so they suspected that her cause of death was one of the pathologists at the Paris morgue was captivated by the beauty of the girl so much that he felt the need to create a wax cast death mask of her face. This is just a story though, and it's not exactly 100% without a doubt true. Another story says that the painter Jules Joseph Lefebvre created a painting of a girl who was dying of tuberculosis, and it was this painting that inspired the creation of that wax mask. The girl was rumored to have died from her illness around the mid-1870s. Then, in another account, the mask was rumored to have been stolen from the daughter of a mask manufacturer that resided in Germany. It's estimated that the girl was 16 at the time of her death, but her identity is still unknown. The Jeff Davis Eight refers to eight different women who were murdered in Jefferson Davis Parish, Louisiana. All of the victims were able to be identified, but as for the exact causes of the deaths, those were very tough to determine as the bodies were severely decomposed, and the culprit was never found. The victims' names were Loretta Lewis, Ernestine Patterson, Kristen Lopez, Whitney Dubois, Laconia Brown, Crystal Zeno, Brittany Gary, and Nicole Guillory. Their ages ranged from 17 to 30, and they all came from similar backgrounds. When researching the victims, all of them had some relation to illegal substances, sex work, or had a history of poor mental health. Furthermore, they all acted as police informants at one point in their lives, giving details on the local substance trade. While I did say that it was tough to determine the cause of death for the victims, there were two victims that had clear cuts in their throats, those two being Patterson and Brown. But one strange thing about the case, besides their similar backgrounds, was that many of the victims actually knew each other. For example, Kristen Lopez and Brittany Gary were actually cousins and Brittany once lived with Crystal Zeno. Then Whitney Dubois had a kid with the brother-in-law of Loretta Lewis. So there is heavy speculation that these women were found out by a gang member or someone of that sort and taken out for leaking information to the police. Furthermore, Kristen Lopez as well as a couple other victims in this case were at a crime scene where police shot and killed a man named Leonard Crochet who was tied up in several illegal activities. One of the suspects was named Frankie Richard who admitted to having sex with many of the victims. Who exactly is Frankie? Well, he owned a strip club and partook in several different illegal activities within the community. Of the victims, the final one he saw was Kristen Lopez, and he was actually charged with her murder, but those charges were eventually dropped due to the mishandling of vital evidence as well as conflicting eyewitness accounts. The next suspects involved Ernestine Patterson. She was known for her work and had met up with two men named Byron Jones and Lawrence Nixon at an abandoned house. According to Lawrence's wife, she saw Lawrence carrying a large industrial-sized trash bag, which he set on their front porch. 
After a short while, she noticed a red liquid creating a pool underneath the bag. She assumed this to be blood, but police didn't act on this lead until 15 months after Patterson's murder, so by that time, they couldn't find anything on the porch. They were quoted saying, failed to demonstrate the presence of blood. This got a lot of the public riled up, with many suspecting that perhaps members of the police force were corrupt. In fact, at one point, the chief criminal investigator in the case, Warren Gary, was being accused of buying the exact truck that was seen at the site where Kristen Lopez was killed. And to make matters worse, the chief bought the Chevy Silverado off a former inmate and friend of Frankie Richard, who again was the club owner we mentioned earlier. Frankie actually died in his sleep in the latter half of March back in 2020. Some investigators thought that it was suicide some thought a freak accident, and some thought he was murdered. But anyways, that truck had not yet been swapped for DNA, and Gary resold it for a 2x gain after cleaning it up. There was an intense dispute on whether Gary knew that the truck was a key part of Lopez's murder, and during that time, Gary was temporarily kicked off of the case. He also received a fine from the Board of Ethics, but this blemish didn't stop him from getting a promotion to the head of evidence. Ultimately, in March of 2016, Warren Gary was shot dead in his sleep by his own grandson. So, this entire case is a big fat mess, but it seems that most people are on the side that there is one or maybe even several corrupt officers tampering with evidence and manipulating the case as a whole behind the scenes. This entry refers to a series of shootings which took place at Penn Station in New York. And the surprising thing about this entry in particular is that I really couldn't find much information on it. As you will soon find out, you'd assume a case like this one would have been documented in much finer detail. I pretty much only had a handful of newspaper articles from the same source from the 80s that covered the events as they unfolded in real time. But there may be an explanation for the lack of info on this case that we will discuss at the end. So towards the end of April of 1983, there was an unidentified individual camping out somewhere in the vicinity of Penn Station with a 25 caliber handgun shooting at people. This entire series of events that we are going to talk about could have turned out to be way worse. In total, there were 7 people who were hit by a bullet from the shooter, but only one of those wounds was fatal. During the height of the investigation, thousands of interviews were conducted with the interviewees ranging from random pedestrians to current and former station employees. Police were even going out of their way to speak with residents in other states, as well as the homeless. The amount of background checks done well exceeded the 40,000 mark. Assistant Chief Richard Dillon was quoted saying it is a very slow, tedious process. The director of the investigation stated that he believed the culprit was a quiet recluse of a man, but has been living in the area for quite some time, so he should be somewhat recognizable. Most of the shots were suspected to have taken place from an elevated level. The first bullet broke through the window of a shelter before hitting a homeless woman in her hip who was fast asleep. She would end up surviving this wound. Then about a month later in May, a hotel employee was struck by a bullet in his hand, and obviously he too would survive. And after the second event, officers didn't yet connect this incident to the shooting of the homeless woman. Fast forward yet another month, an artist by the name of Brant Kingman was shot in the chest near the homeless shelter. The bullet punctured Brant's lung, but he was able to survive. In fact, years down the line, he said that event was the best thing to happen to him. In a way, I'm grateful to the person who shot me. It's an incredible feeling to be totally incapable of anything but breathing and have so many hands helping you to survive. It gave me tremendous confidence in this world. By this time, investigators were comparing the bullets used from these Penn Station shootings to several different murder cases that dated back to the late 70s and early 80s, not knowing that these shootings had no relation to previous crimes. So now we can observe a trend where the culprit is taken about a month in between each shooting. Once another month had passed and July was in full swing, Mildred Cohen, who was in her mid-50s, was shot in the same location as the first homeless woman. This time, the bullet struck the victim's neck. However, Mildred was able to survive. But it gets even crazier when an Amtrak inspector named Arthur Stavley survived a shot to his face. Then in the same month, another employee of the station was shot, but this bullet only barely skimmed the top of his eyelid. This employee's name was Thomas. And I should also note the shots between Mildred and Arthur took about 4 months. So for some reason, the shooter decided to take some time off. 
And after his encounter with Thomas, he yet again chose to veer away from his previous once a month schedule. This time, he didn't return until February, where he fatally wounded a 29 year old man named Richard. Richard was an Amtrak engineer at the time, and he was the only one to actually die from his wound. After this, the sniper seemingly stopped his shooting spree entirely. There has not been another relevant case that was able to be tied to Penn Station. One of the detectives in the case named Joseph Perello, who had been working in the police force for nearly three decades, had his career completely destroyed with this Penn Station case. Joseph was one of the leads in the investigation and had been publicly accused by Commissioner Ward of committing some sort of cover-up to protect the culprit. Ward even went as far as to compare it to Watergate. What this person was doing was engaging in corruption and trying to justify it to save himself. Cover-ups are corruption. You remember Watergate, that big thing in Washington? Of course, former Directive Perello denies being involved in any sort of a cover-up. And remember towards the beginning of this entry, I mentioned that there was very little information out there on this entry aside from the single source. Well, there are several people that believe that this is because the case was a massive embarrassment for the NYPD, so they made an extensive effort to erase as much coverage on the case as possible. But that is simply a theory. This entry is going to be a pretty short one. The striped jaguar is a cryptid or creature that is said to roam around the rainforests of Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. Obviously from the name, you can probably guess that it resembles a tiger with its stripes, but is in fact a jaguar. So it's almost like a, I'm going to use loose quotes here, a mini tiger. Male tigers have been recorded weighing well past 600 pounds at times, while the heavier jaguars are more like in their 300s at the absolute most. Several hunters have told stories about the animal claiming that they barely escaped with their lives after being stalked by the striped jaguar. In 1992, a Peruvian zoologist by the name of Peter Hawking received a skull from a hunter who claimed that it was from a striped jaguar. The skull did resemble that of a jaguar, albeit it was just a bit narrower. Peter, although intrigued, was skeptical that such an animal actually existed. Dennis Martin is the name of a boy who went missing in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park at just 6 years old, and he was actually just a few days away from turning 7. On June 14th, 1969, Dennis went on a camping trip with his family. The group consisted of his dad, grandfather, older brother, a family friend, as well as two young boys not related to him. Within the National Park Service incident report, it is stated that Dennis was last seen at 4.30 p.m. Dennis was playing around with the other kids in the group in an area covered with grass along the Tennessee and North Carolina state line. The incident report shared that the kids were playing hide and seek, but as they began to get bored, one of them had the idea to scare the adults. The boys were going to sneak up and scare their family. The two older boys went one way and Dennis went the other way. The plan was for them to jump out of the woods on both sides and scare the adults. It was here that Dennis went missing. The older boys jumped out and everyone laughed and had a lot of fun. Then they asked where Dennis was. When it came time for Dennis to show up and scare the family, he never showed up. Not wanting to take any chances, Dennis's father Bill took off scouring for his son after 5 minutes had passed. Bill was hopeful that it wouldn't take long to find Dennis since he was wearing a red t-shirt which really stuck out in the forest. Bill hiked through the woods for about 2 miles before stopping and retracing his steps as he believed that there was no way Dennis made it any further. He thought to himself that it was more likely Dennis was either trapped or wandering in an area that he had passed already. The family and friends split up and continued their search. Bill stayed in the general area, going off in different directions, while the grandfather went to Cade's Cove, which is actually where they came from. As time went on and Dennis was still missing, Bill decided to contact National Park Service rangers for help. Not long after Dennis disappeared, rain began pouring down on the park, and the area they were in at the time was called Spence Field and the place had numerous slopes and ravines. Furthermore, there were animals such as copperhead snakes, bears, feral hogs, and bobcats around there. A quote said they hollered for him but couldn't find him. For anyone, it is very easy to get lost around in the thick rhododendron and rugged terrain up there, but especially a little boy. Another problem at Spence Field is there seems to be an incessant wind that comes out of Tennessee and whips over the mountain. You could blow and whistle up there and the wind drowns it out. By the time morning rolled around, the rain was approximately 2.5 inches. Hundreds of crews were sent out to search through the trails and creeks for Dennis in the days that followed. 
As news spread about Dennis, hundreds of additional search parties were formed consisting of hikers clubs, boy scouts, and a bunch of volunteers from the public. Red Cross stepped in to provide resources such as food and water, while helicopters and canine units were also dispatched. It went from hundreds of people to where you eventually had 1400 people saturating the search area. If you got 1400 people, they stomped on everything. It just doesn't work. Every broken branch an experienced tracker looks for has been trampled. You've got search dogs that cannot sniff out any clues because there were 1400 people there. We did searches back then like they were forest fires. You surrounded it and drowned it. All in all, the search cost $50,000, which adjusted with inflation, is over 400 k today. Less than two weeks later, the story had reached every corner of the US. When it seemed that all avenues had been explored, Dennis's family sought the help of the FBI, but they didn't get involved as they said they only assist in the search if they believed foul play was involved. Involved. There are many, many theories for the disappearance of Dennis Martin, ranging from abduction, animals, serial killers, or simply succumbing to the elements of nature. There was a small footprint that was found by a group of hikers that was about three and a half miles from Spence Field. It was thought that this may have belonged to Dennis, but no other signs of him were found in the area. Then there was another lead from a man named Harold who said he saw an unkempt man roaming the outskirts of the forest. Around the same time that he noticed the man, he heard a scream from what sounded like a child. At one point, there was even a hunter who reported finding the remains of a kid, but this turned out to be a straight up lie after investigators searched the area and found nothing of the sort. While there are many possible explanations, it seems that many people believe that Dennis may have just gotten lost and one thing led to another and he just got deeper and deeper into a location where nobody would think to look. Either that or he may have been abducted. Bouvet Island is a small island that is primarily covered in ice and is regarded as one of the most remote islands in the world. The closest land is the coast of Antarctica and that is nearly 1,000 miles away, but despite how remote the island is, it has quite a history. Bouvet was first discovered on January 1st, 1739 by Jean-Baptiste Bouvet de Lazier and later became lost for 69 years since Bouvet had incorrectly marked its location. It later turned back up in 1808 after several decorated explorers failed to find it. So knowing all this, how exactly did the small lifeboat that you see now arrive at such an isolated location? And where exactly did it come from? Needless to say, the lifeboat did not have any details on it to help reveal its origin. If we fast forward to 1964, the South Africans issued two vessels to rendezvous at Bouvet, but due to unsafe conditions, this journey was delayed. But eventually, they decided to attempt a landing with a helicopter, and this trip was led by Lieutenant Commander Alan Crawford. When the helicopter neared the island, Crawford noticed the out-of-place abandoned lifeboat, which was half swamped and surrounded by a colony of seals. The following was an excerpt by Crawford himself. What drama, we wondered, was attached to this strange discovery? There were no markings to identify its origin or nationality. On the rocks a hundred yards away was a 44-gallon drum and a pair of oars, with pieces of wood and a copper flotation or buoyancy tank opened out flat for some purpose. Thinking castaways might have landed, we made a brief search but found no human remains. Crawford was stumped as to how such a tiny vessel survived crossing through the southern ocean with just a pair of oars. As far as he could tell, the boat never had a mast and sail or an engine. But what Crawford was most curious about was the fate of the person or crew that manned the lifeboat. Crawford's team was on the island for less than an hour and thus couldn't properly investigate their discovery. They gathered rock samples and only ventured a few yards from shore in each direction. Although they didn't go too deep, they were keeping an eye out for bodies or any sign of habitation, but they didn't find anything. In 1966, there was a biological survey group that had taken a particular interest in Bouvet Island, particularly the lagoon. However, they never mentioned whether or not the lifeboat was still there. In fact, it seemed like Crawford was the only person to ever mention it. The B1 Butcher is an unidentified serial killer from southern Africa, specifically Namibia. He is responsible for the deaths of at least five women, which he murdered between 2005 and 2007. All of these bodies were found along or close to the B1 highway, hence the name. The Butcher's victims were young or middle-aged women, with two of them being impossible to identify. The three who were identified are 21-year-old Juanita Mabula, 22-year-old Melanie Jantz, and 36-year-old Santa Helena. The 
The killer dismembered all of his victims prior to dumping them along the B1 highway. Additionally, it seemed although he had frozen some if not all of the body parts. The causes of death varied. While Melanie was strangled, Juanita had fractures along her skull from an unknown blunt object. It's also believed that at least two of the three identified victims were sex workers. There were two primary suspects in the mid to late 2000s, the first of which was a German-born man named Heinz Nierum. Heinz was suspected of raping a 29-year-old woman sometime around July of 2007. Heinz was adamant that nothing of the sort had happened. The victim also mentioned that the culprit had attempted to strangle her, which led to some investigators believing Heinz could have been the B1 butcher. But ultimately, in February of 2010, he was found not guilty due to a lack of evidence. Heinz then sued the Namibian government for being accused of being the butcher. The second notable suspect was a man named Hans Husselman who took his own life in 2008 after he had been accused of being the killer. Prior to the accusation, Hans had served a life sentence for two murders before being released in 2004. The evidence in Hans's case was also deemed inconclusive. While some believe that Hans took his life because he was the killer, some were of the opinion that the man just couldn't come to terms with serving more time in prison for a crime he didn't actually commit. Either way, after his death, many investigators began to theorize that perhaps the B1 murders were done by not one but several people. Authorities said it was possible that there was one mastermind leading a group of killers or there were several copycats that were trying to hide under the guise of the B1 butcher. Under the moonlit sky of March 8th, 2014, at precisely 12.42 a.m., a Malaysia Airlines Boeing 777-200ER gracefully soared into motion from Kuala Lumpur, embarking on its journey to Beijing. Guiding the plane was First Officer Farik Hamid, a youthful 27-year-old who was at the helm of a pivotal training flight, marking the culmination of his certification process. Overseeing the flight was Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah a distinguished 53-year-old pilot and a senior figure at Malaysia Airlines. Known simply as Zahari, he led with his wealth of experience. A family man with ties to a gated community, Zahari owned two residences. Within one of those dwellings, he curated an intricate Microsoft flight simulator. In the cockpit, there was a mutual respect between Farik and Zahari, with Zahari's approachability being a notable trait. So on March 8th, the plane climbed to 10,700 meters, which is about 35,000 feet, by 1.01 a.m. And here is where things start getting weird. The ACARS, or the Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System, goes quiet after sending its last data ping at 1.07 a.m. It basically just shut off like a light switch, but it gets even weirder. The crew's last chat comes in at 1.19 a.m. and then at 1.21, the plane's transponder gets switched off right when it's crossing into Vietnamese airspace over the South China Sea, which is some pretty suspicious timing. But the radar was still functioning and it observed something equally as strange. At 1.30 a.m., the flight decides to make a U-turn heading southwest over the Malay Peninsula and then northwest over the Strait of Malacca. But the weirdness doesn't stop there. By 2.22 a.m., the radar is basically like I'm done with this nonsense and lost track of the plane completely as it soared over the Andaman Sea. Meanwhile, this satellite called MRSAT goes crazy in the sky, sending signals every hour from 1.07 a.m. to 8.11 a.m. The flight was officially lost and thus the search parties went into overdrive. First they scoured the South China Sea, but then they figured the plane must have taken a detour west after the transponder issue, so attention shifted to the Strait of Malacca and the Andaman Sea. But as you probably expect, they didn't find anything. Fast forward to March 24th, 2014, which is about two weeks later, Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak steps in and drops a bombshell. He says, based on some satellite and investigation detail, Flight 370 is gone. It had crashed into the Indian Ocean around 25 kilometers, which is about 1500 miles, southwest of Australia. Zero survivors is the most likely outcome. But even though they came to this conclusion, there was still another task at hand. The wreckage of the plane still needed to be found, but finding that crash site is just like finding a needle in a haystack, essentially impossible. 
It takes until July 29th, 2015 for a single piece of the plane to wash ashore on Reunion Island. And it's not alone. More bits show up on beaches in Africa and islands nearby. These pieces were kind of like puzzle bits slowly coming together telling a story. Three of them were from Flight 370 for sure, and 17 of them are strong maybes. And unfortunately, these pieces were not enough to tell us the true fate of Flight 370. Was it a breakup mid-air or a crash into the sea? The search was officially concluded concluded in 2017 with far from favorable results. But then Ocean Infinity, which is a marine robotics company, steps in with a brief search. They also found nothing. In the aftermath of Flight 370's perplexing disappearance, a torrent of theories flooded the scene. Possibilities swung from mechanical glitches to the haunting specter of pilot suicide. The vanishing acts of ACARS and the transponder signals fueled ceaseless chatter, sparking a vortex of debates around potential hijacking scenarios. Yet there was a bizarre silence as no entity laid claim to taking over this flight, and the notion of hijackers steering the plane to the southern Indian Ocean appeared to be a tenuous one at best. The winds of speculation pointed inward as evidence hinted at a harrowing possibility. The signals had been meticulously shut off from within the confines of the aircraft. The chilling possibility of crew-initiated super materialized, casting a curtain of darkness over the narrative. Puzzlingly, the behavior of the captain, first officer, and cabin crew yielded no glaring abnormalities, complicating this haunting theory. 2016 cast a spotlight on an eerie revelation. The pilot, within the realm of his own flight simulator, had embarked on a simulated odyssey over the southern Indian Ocean mere weeks before the aircraft's enigmatic departure from reality. Strangely echoing the final path of the missing plane, this simulation unveiled by New York Magazine thrust the narrative into an unsettling realm. The puzzle deepened as glimpses of the pilot's personal life surfaced, their intricacies lending credence to the disquieting notion of premeditated pilot-triggered catastrophe. And then, amidst a fog of uncertainty, emerged the notion of a shattering alternative, that Flight 370 had met its end through the fiery kiss of projectiles. Far-fetched whispers grew that it might have been downed by a missile, yet the sands of reality revealed no scars of missile shrapnel, no echoes of projectiles in the debris. In the wake of this unraveling enigma, the tale teetered on the precipice of understanding, poised between the jagged edges of reality and the chasms of the unknown. The world watched, caught in a silent dance of questions as Flight 370's saga continued to elude the grasp of definitive closure. Ronald Hughes was an attorney who died in November of 1970 at the age of 35 and is most famously known for his representation of a Manson family cult member named Leslie Von Hooten. Most of you likely have heard of the notorious Manson family cult, but just on the off chance that you haven't, I'll briefly provide some background on them. The cult was led by Charles Manson and was active in California around the late 1960s and early 70s. Charles Manson was able to recruit over a hundred people to follow him, most of them being young women, and influenced them to live very odd and unconventional lifestyles. He also regularly forced the use of psychoactive substances and hallucinogens upon them. And on top of that, the people involved at the very top were just insane and are well known for being responsible for numerous murders. There are even many homicide cases that are unsolved that investigators believe could be related to the cult. So now that we know a bit about the cult, let's talk about Ronald Hughes. On November 30th, 1970, Ronald failed to return to the Tate LaBianca murder trial after going on a camping trip during a 10-day recess. This camping trip was only meant to last a weekend and he went with two 17-year-old neighbors named James Forsher and Lauren Elder. The group of three took Elder's Volkswagen and arrived at the Cesp Hot Springs at the Los Padres National Forest on November 27th. When the group arrived, the area was blasted with a massive rainstorm, which made Forsher and Elder decide they wanted to go back to Los Angeles. Ronald had other plans though. He wanted to stay behind and work on some of his talking points for the trial. The two teens said that's fine and left on the morning of the 28th. But since the Volkswagen was stuck in the mud, they were forced to hitchhike their way home. Ronald was last seen by a group of three campers who stopped and chatted with him. The rainstorm persisted as Ronald stayed at the campsite and even caused some flooding which led to an evacuation of the area. When November 30th rolled around, which was the date the trial was supposed to resume, Ronald didn't show up. This resulted in a new attorney being assigned to the trial and a search for Ronald at the campsite. 
The abandoned Volkswagen was easy to spot, but there was no trace of Ronald himself. The search was made even more difficult due to the storms wiping away any possible tracks or scents. Police questioned Elder and Forsher, who were both subjected to polygraph tests, and they both passed. It wasn't until March 29, 1971, when Ronald's body was discovered. Two fishermen were venturing past a gorge in Ventura County when they noticed a pretty large mass wedged between two boulders. When the two men got closer and had a better look, they realized it was the body of a man. This man was Ronald. He was found approximately 8 miles from where he was last seen by those three campers, and they had to use his dental records to positively ID him. And due to the state of the body, medical officials couldn't determine the cause of death. The Ventura County Sheriff stated that he couldn't find any noticeable signs of foul play and thought it was more likely for Ronald's death to have been accidental. The Sheriff believed that this is how events unfolded. The huge rainstorm flooded the area, causing the creek to swell and drag Ronald away by accident. From here, the Sheriff thought that it was possible Ronald drowned before having his body destroyed from the rocks and debris. Or he was still alive while being swept away in the flood and was killed by those rocks and debris before getting stuck between the boulders. But due to the circumstances of his death, many people believe that the Manson family had something to do with Ronald's death. Why did the Manson family want Ronald dead? Well, theorists believe that Charles Manson himself wanted a different attorney assigned to Leslie as Ronald tried to separate Leslie's personal interests and the family's interests. What that meant was Leslie was ready to take the fall for any crimes that she didn't even commit. This greatly angered Ronald and he was quoted saying, I refuse to take part in any proceeding where I am forced to push a client out the window. It was here when that 10 day recess was issued and Ronald said that he was immensely confident that he could lock down an acquittal for Leslie. On a bit of a lighter note, this next entry is about the unknown reason why the famous streamer Guy Beam, or better known as Dr. Disrespect, was banned on Twitch. In the summer of 2020, Dr. Disrespect was permanently banned from the top streaming site, and I'm not sure about the numbers now, but at the time, he was one of the most followed streamers in the world. The banning came just after he signed a multi-year contract, which locked the streamer to exclusively streaming on Twitch. Over the course of two years, Dr. Disrespect and Twitch went head-to-head -head in a legal battle, which resulted in neither side conceding to the other. And of course, the reason behind why he was even banned never got revealed. On June 27th, 2020, the streamer tweeted out the following, Twitch has not notified me on the specific reason behind their decision. Firm handshakes to all for the support during this difficult time. Doc did go live on YouTube on August 7th, 2020 and stated there was no future for him on Twitch and that he was in talks with YouTube to stream there exclusively. Then a year later, Dr. Disrespect claimed that he was speaking with his legal team to sue Twitch for his ban the previous year in 2020. Additionally, he mentioned that he knew exactly why he was banned and disagreed that it was worth banning him over. There's a reason why, and I'll just say this right now, champs. There's a reason why we're suing the fuck out of him, okay? I don't know how else to put it. The amount of damages, and you just don't. Nah. Theories regarding why Dr. Disrespect was banned vary quite drastically, but one that I found quite interesting suggests that Twitch may have not wanted to fulfill that multi-year contract. In 2016, a competitor to Twitch named Mixer was launched by Microsoft. Mixer's plan to onboard users and overtake Twitch was to buy out the largest streamers in the industry. So in 2019, they signed Ninja and Shroud, with Ninja's contract supposedly being valued at $30 million. With two of the largest performers gone, Twitch frantically contacted the big streamers that were still on their site to sign exclusivity deals. So, this theory proposes that Twitch may have offered Dr. Disrespect a large 8-figure contract to sort of fight off Mixer. However, when Mixer shut down and their exclusive streamers went back to Twitch for free, they didn't want to pay Dr. Disrespect the money. Twitch made it incredibly clear that it was never to be revealed why Doc was banned because there may be public outrage, and I think this definitely could be a possibility. And if this was the case, it's also understandable why Doc would want to take legal action. That is going to end off part 15 of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. If you made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for spending your time with me. And in the last video, I asked for everyone who got to the end to leave behind a vomit emoji to see how many of you made it that far. And there were way more than I expected. So this time, if you made it here, leave behind a whale emoji and I'll drop you a heart. I also want to give a huge, huge, huge thank you to the Patreon. At the time of recording this, we have over 20 members on there, which completely 
blew me away. I was thinking that if we could hit five or so in like a week, that would already be amazing. But no, over 20 of you guys went and supported the Patreon, so thank you all so much. And of course, my YouTube members as well, thank you all for the support. I recently updated the pricing there, so it removed all my members, but minus five stars and Sasha, I know you two have been there for a long time and you were quick to come back, so thank you two so much for your continued support. I really want to stack the Patreon and memberships with exclusive videos, so I'm working on smaller like 7 to 10 minute videos as well that will go up for you guys only, and of course on the Patreon you will get the TCAP Iceberg series. So before we end the video, I want to shout out Synth Runner, Sasha Wise, Minus 5 Stars, Ray Booney, John Thomas, Sin Moncour, Len, Sophie Livingstone, Sally Bunce, Dip Shizzle, Pedro Elizondo Jr., Halofan234, Owl Youp, 4L60E, Beck Walls, Steve Sharofsky, Grace, Adventure Ted, Taylor Stone King, Ray, Maine Adam, David Veltman, Derek Waterbury, Morgan Smith, Jonah Hudson, Victor, so sorry I'm going to butcher your last name, is it Chamil, Sarah Crude, Greg, Maui, Sarah Richardson, and Jackson W. Thank you all so much for your support. And if any of you guys that are still watching want to support me and the channel outside of just watching the videos, you can either become a member or a patron. The memberships are a dollar and will grant you access to those exclusive videos and you also get early access to all of my videos with no mid-rolls. The Patreon starts at two bucks but the two tiers are the exact same. You also get early access to the vids there but the ads on there slightly differ in their delivery as I can be much more explicit with the details on Patreon. You will also get access to the much beloved exclusive TCAP Iceberg series, which I am currently working on and will likely go live there sometime mid to early September. And if you support either the memberships or the Patreon, your name will be at the beginning and end of all of my videos. So once more, thanks again for all of you guys who come back to watch my videos every single time. It means a lot. So stay safe everyone and I'll hope you all have an amazing week.